Michael Hudgens, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup. You are a systematics and evolution master student studying paleontology at the University of Alberta in Canada, and your main research centers around primitive ornithopods and animals of the Triassic period, as well as the origins of dinosaurs in general. So uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for uh, having me on. Uh, it's a real pleasure just to talk about my work and uh, dinosaurs in general. Right. So before we begin, let's just hear a little bit about you, your background, uh, your beginnings. So Mike, mm -hmm. where did you grow up and when did you first get interested in paleontology and when did you know that this was what you wanted to do? So I grew up in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia in the United States. Uh, so I am a international student at the University of Alberta in Canada. So I'm really far away from home. I'm about 3,000 kilometers away from wow. home. Um, but I initially got interested in paleontology, uh, similarly with most kids uh, uh, and most workers in the field, is when I was a child, I was probably like around two or three when I became very interested in the natural world, uh, rocks and animals, both uh, prehistoric and living today. And uh, when I was a kid, I would constantly read books about them uh, growing up. But I figured out rather late in my teenage and early 20 years that I wanted to make paleontology a career and return to school for it because I've had that really strong interest ever since I was younger. Right. Well, I think a good place to start is to ask what a typical day might be for you and what is it exactly that a paleontologist does, both mm -hmm. in the lab and in the field. Uh, I take it it's not exactly like what we saw in Jurassic Park? <laughs> um, no, it is not like Jurassic Park whatsoever. So my typical day is really in the office or in the lab. And I usually start around seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning. And currently right now, I've been reading up a lot of the published literature that is relevant to my research. And it usually takes uh, the vast majority of my day when I'm not teaching or grading labs as a teaching assistant. But usually towards the end of my day in lab, I look at new fossil material that has come out of, this, out of the field for the past uh, in the past couple of years. And I've been looking at it and just describing it uh, initially. Um, and then just coming up with future research questions and hypotheses for, uh, to test in the future. But we, in the lab currently I'm in right now, we have 3D laser scanners and software for muscle and skeletal modeling. And this is usually just looking at for bone and soft tissue components for biomechanical mm -hmm. systems. And that helps us model them, how they would walk and move and how their limbs moved. And we also have access to uh, a histological lab, basically. And histology is just a really fun way of cutting open bone and then looking at the bone structures under a microscope. And we use these methods and these tools to perform our research within the lab. But uh, in the fields, uh, it's a little bit more fun. Uh, this past August, I did some field work with the Boreal Alberta Dinosaur Project, which is a joint effort between uh, paleontologists from universities, including the U of A, and museums both internationally and domestic here in Canada. Uh, but this project is just usually focusing on uh, learning about Northern Alberta dinosaur taxa and other extinct creatures. And in the field, a typical day is usually we eat breakfast, obviously, but uh, we hike out to our locations all the time. And it's usually right next to a river, which is we get really beautiful views and such. And then also dig up for uh, some dinosaur bones. Uh, but as paleontologists, we don't really use any fancy tools to excavate, as in the scene in Jurassic Park. Uh, we use very simple to tools, such as uh, tooth and paint brushes, uh, awls, which are basically these, this pick kind of tool to pry mm. away the rock, and a rock hammer to tap away with the awl really delicately at the rock to expose the bone. So it's pretty but basic. Huh? Very basic. It's, it's, <laughs> you'd be surprised how primitive uh, it really is. But we uh, delicately chip away at the rock with using these tools and then brush away the dirt and the rock away from the fossil until we get all sides of the fossil, fossil well exposed. And usually they're ranging it from really small fossils to really large fossils, such as like femurs of large hadrosaurs, which are pretty, pretty big. But once we start cool. uh, chipping away the rock around the exterior of the fossil, uh, we start to wet paper towel and putting on top of the fossil as a protective mm. barrier before we use a plaster burlap jacket. So a plaster burlap jacket is just 
what it sounds like. We have burlap from like a burlap sack and then we just dip it inside plaster. And so um, we make the plaster and then we dip the burlap in it and then wrap it around the fossil. But we try to make it conform to the shape of the fossil as close as possible. Yeah. And so, so it makes it protected and it doesn't be bulky because we also have to take it out of the field. And so the bulkier it is, the harder it is to take it out. Uh, so we take uh, the fossil out of the field uh, and we try to keep it as light as possible uh, because it's really hard to take it out because the hike is usually from a, mile, uh, excuse me, a kilometer to two kilometers. And it's usually depending on if it's uphill or downhill. And it's usually very strenuous to take rather large fossils out of the, out of the, out of the woods. I can imagine. Mm. This is quite an old process, isn't it? Because I, I think I've seen pictures and illustrations going back, you know, to Mary Anning's time in the 1800s, and they're wrapping, it looks like, white plaster strips around things. Yep, uh, it's, it hasn't changed. It's the same process that Mary Anning and uh, Char uh, Marsh and Cope have been using for centuries now. It's just never changed. Is the best it way works. to get fossils. Yeah, it works. Um, sometimes we use a helicopter to take out really large fossils, um, yeah. like if, if it's like a, an entire skeleton and we have it still encased in the rock, it's too heavy for us to take out because it's usually around like anywhere between a ton to about any excess of like 50 tons. And so there's no way we'd have to get a helicopter to take it out. But then we usually just pry the fossil from the rock when we have the plaster hardened and just tip it over. And then we want rock still at the bottom because you don't want the fossil coming out. And then we take it and put it on our backpacks or just carry it by hand and then outside the field. And that's usually a typical day of just being outside in nature, digging fossils, looking for fossils, taking them out, and then hiking back out. And then repeat the process for the next day. Cool. Okay, so let's talk about dinosaurs. Everybody loves dinosaurs, as we know. Mm -hmm. And most people know that they lived during the Triassic through the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous period and into today, if you count birds, of course. But what isn't so well known is how that dinosaur lineage kicked off. The Triassic period began over, I think it's 250 million years ago, but at the start, dinosaurs weren't the top dogs at all, were they? Nope. So during the Triassic period, you have these group of organisms called Pseudosuchians. And Pseudosuchians are a clade of archosaur, archosaurian organisms that are more closely related to crocodiles than they are birds. And this group would typically include adiosaurs, rhyosuchids, papasaurids, and crocodilomorphs, as well as phytosaurs. These are all very different group members, which I'll explain in due time. Um, but during this time period, Pseudosuchians were the dominant organisms of this ecosystem during the Triassic period, and Dinosauria were relatively rare organisms during the middle and the early late Triassic. But Dinosauria gradually became more and more abundant in the fossil record and then occupied niches that the Pseudosuchians previously occupied. So Rawasuchians were these top terrestrial predators of the late Triassic. And Theropoda, which is the meat-eating dinosaurs, were the subsidiary, the second tier predator of that time. Um, they were very small too. Rawasuchians were, were large terrestrial erect quadrupedal, and some taxa of this group were also bi probably bipedal. And then adiosaurs occupied the herbivorous niche, similar to a pig. But the reason for this transition is still up for debate and is still being worked out currently. And much, a lot more research needs to be done to really figure out the entire story of why this transition between uh, Pseudosuchian and line archosaurs to dinosauria happened. But it's, very, it's a very complex and challenging problem. So in a nutshell, you're saying way back at the beginning, uh, there were these crocodile-like creatures, which somehow gave rise to the dinosaurs, but we're not entirely sure how that transition happened. Not yet. Not yet. I mean, there's been a few ideas, um, the multiple ones, uh, such as being out, uh, dinosaurs outcompeted these uh, these pseudosuchian type organisms. Um, and also dinosaurs probably ha had this unique anatomical characteristic that pseudosuchians probably didn't have and they just out and dinosaur outcompeted pseudosuchians eventually. And then also uh, climate change has been an, an argument that uh, rapidly changing climate and then just, or just current, uh, current episodes of really climactic change has led, that drove uh, pseudosuchians 
uh, to extinction and allowed uh, dinosauria uh, to become the top uh, terrestrial organisms of that time period. Also, so that is the sort of go-to explanation. You know, it must have been climate, but we don't always know that, do we? Um, I mean, we have, we can always do like proxy or we can test certain ideas and then take, uh, usually it's through stable isotope analysis uh, of carbonates in the soils. But also, we can also do modeling of different things, such as uh, models of uh, pyrite and organic carbon weathering and burial. And that usually tells us what the oxygen of that time period was doing. And then there's also methods for to figure out what the climate was exactly doing by doing uh, climate models and weather models. And we figured out that there was large monsoons happening on the eastern coast of Pangaea during that time period, because uh, Pangaea was a thing during the uh, Triassic period, where all the continents together, and you would have these massive monsoons happening on the uh, east coast of the continent at that time period. Ornithopods, I mean, all dinosauria were part of the Triassic ecosystem during that time period, around the Carnian stage, which is about 230 million years ago. And then these ornithischians and theropods, ornithischians are the bird hip dinosaurs, which would be include the duck billed dinosaurs and uh, like stegosaurus and uh, triceratops. But their early relatives and theropods were very rare, perhaps even ab absent at the time at that time period during the Carnian stage 230 million years ago. And theropods are basically two legged dinosaurs. Yeah, the the two legged meat eating dinosaurs, and they they are the same. Right. Yes, they would be like Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus rex. Um, Right. But the first dinosaur radiation was characterized by higher diversity of herrerasaurs, which are are kind of an are a predatory group, but they have ambiguous affinities within the dinosaur family tree. And there are usually, and also there was also small-bodied uh, sauropodomorphs, which are the long-necked dinosaurs, the plant-eating dinosaurs. But they were much smaller during the Triassic period. But uh, the next stage in the Triassic period, which we call the Norian. Uh, which is about 220 million years ago within the late Triassic period, uh, dinosaurs became much more diverse and abundant within the fossil record. But only in the Jurassic period did they achieve that ecological dominance that we all know, like with Stegosaurus and Allosaurus in the late Jurassic. But the transition was probably, this is going back into the climate, this was probably triggered by multiple climatic events and crises, such as the Carnian Pluvio episode. So the Carnian Pluvio episode it uh, just means that it happened during the Carnian period, which is about 230 million years ago. And pluvial means rain. And then episode is just, it happened multiple times. So you have a multiple uh, climactic events happening at this time period. That uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Provinces, or just camps for short. Mm -hmm. and, the, and this is basically when Pangaea was rifting apart to form the Atlantic Ocean. And you have a bunch of these flood basalts, these uh, volcanic activity uh, pumping out a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, and possibly uh, and causing a lot of different climatic changes because of global warming and um, just climate change in general from uh, an abundant amount of CO2 being pushed up into the atmosphere. And this was this happened during the uh, around 201.3 million years ago uh, at the boundary between the tri Triassic and Jurassic. This probably in turn eliminated several of these Pseudosuchian line organisms uh, such as the adiosaurs, the papasaurids, and the rausukians. These empty niches and were part uh, occupied by dinosaurs and then the dinosaurs then flourished in form of great diversity of forms after the niches were emptied out and so they got more, it's basically uh, adaptive radiation at that point where you have an, a, a niche emptying out a group of organisms that were already preoccupied like the top predatory role and then that organism just disappeared, which went extinct. And then the subsidiary organism takes its place. And then you have a massive radiation of different, a massive uh, biodiversity of forms evolving in a short period of time because that niche had been emptied out by uh, its former uh, successor. The question is really what made the dinosaurs really resilient to the conditions that drove other lineages to extinction in the Intriassic? And what followed, the, what allowed them to have their ex, uh, exceptional radiation on land uh, uh, and land ecosystems after that? So, the their evolutionary success of dinosaurs is potentially explained by their morphological and physiological traits, and mostly including probably bipedal locomotion with upright limbs. 
and possibly an advanced breathing system with unidirectional flow and air sac, uh, basically air sac lungs. Well, not really technically lungs, but they don't serve as like a way to, uh, for gas exchange. They're just air sacs presence, mm. uh, within the lungs. And this, these air sacs, uh, pneumatize, they, they form holes within the vertebral column. They invade the vertebral column, these air sacs uh, of the dinosaur without sacrificing structural integri integrity, which is really, really cool. So their bones are actually very, very light, just like a, a regular bird's bones. And this is where this, unidirect, this, air, this respiratory system uh, evolved in originally, and these and the birds just inherited over time. And also the uh, dinosaurs probably had a, a higher metabolism compared to pseudosuchians right. based on fast growing, growing juveniles using looking at bone histology and uh and this is much more controversial and they prob like early dinosaurs probably had these filiform like feathers but there's some problems with it because we don't have any feathered dinosaurs from the triassic period but if we use uh, phylogenetic bracketing we can figure it out that the most likely answer uh for where feathers evolved in was probably at the base of the tree of dinosaurs mm -hmm. uh, at the first, like the common ancestor for dinosaurs. But there's that, that problem still being worked out because we don't really technically have fossil evidence. We have uh, phylogenetic evidence, which is, which is still good. But also during this time period, during the tri and during the Triassic period, uh, the atmosphere was completely, completely different from the atmosphere we have today. Um, and may have played a, uh, a role in dinosaurs dominating the ecosystem during the Triassic period. So CO2 was ex exceptionally, exceptionally high during this time period. And the atmospheric CO2 probably reached around 2,000 to 5,500 parts per million as compared to the 300, high 300, low 400 parts per million today, which is really, really high, which is about five to 14 times higher than present day levels. And then also survive back then then no we no, would if don't we, do any we time would, travelers <laughs> no yeah if you, if you went back in time and stepped out into the triassic period you would probably need uh, a spacesuit because you would not be able wow. to breathe the atmosphere at that time period which is really crazy to think about because this is this is our own planet uh yeah. and it's a very much an alien world and yeah you would probably <laughs> so there'll be large terrestrial crocodile like animals chasing around and then you'd be completely out of breath because you're not used to the atmosphere whatsoever Dude. but also the the oxygen level was also quite different uh right now uh, currently it's about 21 percent oxygen in our atmosphere but during the triassic period it actually was decreasing from about 22 percent to 16 percent towards the end of the triassic period so then again co2 high co2 and low o2 would not allow you to breathe the atmosphere of the Triassic period. It was a very, very much, very a different time uh, during the Triassic period. But those but, creatures, they thrived yes, on they it. Did. Yes, uh, yes they did. So it might be in part to the unidirectional, the, the really advanced respiratory system that these early dinosaurs had, and possibly why these Pseudosuchians went out because they didn't have this uh, advanced respiratory system. But with the given atmosphere condition of the late Triassic, these organisms must have been able, like you said, to persist in this low oxygen and high CO2 environment. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, the extant avians, the extant birds have this unique respiratory system uh, and possessing these pneumatization of their bones, these holes in their bones of their, post, of their, of their skeletal system, where these air sac systems invade the bones. Mm -hmm. um, the avian respiratory system serves as a way to store extra air and not as gas exchange, but the ventilation system of this unidirectional airflow allows air, fresh air to be constantly flowing during inspiration and expiration and allowing for a really efficient gas exchange in the organism. So if you want to, if you think humans are the pinnacle of evolution, no, it's actually, it's really birds because they have this amazing, efficient, respiratory system that mammals just do not have and this allows ex living birds living f birds that fly to function at really high altitudes despite being really oxygen efficient at that high because they have this really unique respiratory system that allows them to achieve this amazing feat so the presence of this unique respiratory system in dinosaurs may have allowed dinosaurs to have that extra advantage 
within the Triassic environment in comparison to their Pseudosuchian uh, competitors, basically. But how this respiratory system most likely evolved is probably not as exciting as you think it is, but mostly as an exaptation. And what exaptation is basically a co-option describes as a shift in function of a trait during evolution. So for example, a trait can evolve because it served one particular purpose or function, but not for the function that it has currently. So what that means is that, so these air sacs reduce the weight of the skeletal system of the organisms. So it wasn't originally, the air sacs weren't originally adapted for efficient respiratory system, but instead originally adapted for mass and density reduction. And so this reduced the metabolic uh, metabolic energy cost of the organism and saving energy through locomotion and foraging. And so the animal was, the dinosaurs are much more efficient at moving around and catching prey. So when the O2 was O2 and the CO2 was increasing and de uh, decreasing and increasing, this allowed the air sacs to be selected for another reason, which was being more efficient at breathing in uh, a really poor atmosphere of low O2 and high CO2, and then outcompeted their uh, pseudosuchian uh, organisms of that time period. So the rise of dinosauria may have been a multifaceted event that persisted over millions of years with a combination of the carbon, uh, excuse me, of the Carnian polluvial episode causing uh, the niches of the Pseudosuchians to empty out uh, and then therefore allowing dinosauria to occupy them. As well as the decreasing oxygen and the wavering CO2 during the Triassic period may have allowed a selective advantage of an efficient respiratory system for a gas exchange in, in the low oxygen levels and may have played a critical role in the subsequent evolutionary success of dinosauria over Pseudosuchian and allow them to really shine in the Jurassic and the later Cretaceous period. But there is still a much uncertainty regarding the origin of dinosaurs. And But with current research, um, this is most likely what happened, but more research needs to be done uh, before we can really definitively say what exactly happened. Mike, you also study a group of organisms called Thessalosaurs, which were a genus of smaller nithopod dinosaurs that appeared at the very end of the late Cretaceous period in North America. So what exactly is an ornithopod and how does the study of these creatures relate to the rise of dinosaurs in general? Okay, um, so ornithopods are part of the group Ornithischians, which are a type of dinosaur that have this bird-like hip uh, structure in their in their hip region and ornithopods just basically means uh, bird foot and so they have this foot that looks oddly like a bird but they're not really closely related to birds um, but these ornithopods are basically are typically uh, bipedal unarmored herb herbivorous dinosaurs and uh, and thesalosaurs are a group of primitive ornithopods well currently a, a group of primitive ornithopods that lived around the early cretaceous to late cretaceous and to be honest, not much is really known about the evolution of Thessalosaur evolution um, or primitive basal or basal pr primitive ornithopods in general. Uh, there just hasn't been a lot of work done on them. They're, they're pretty much a neglected group within paleontology. And this is for why people don't, for people who don't know, can you explain what basal means? Oh, so, okay. Uh, so basal is just like the fancy scientific word for primitive. So it is literally the base of the, of a phylogenetic yeah. sort of, uh, tree. Yes. It yeah. Is the, yes. It's the group that is at the base of the phylogenetic tree. And it's the most, yeah. uh, it has features that are most closely resembling the common ancestor of that group. And so these basal ornithopods uh, had all the characteristics of what the common ancestor of ornithopods and ornithis or ornithischians would have at the base of the tree. And they were very small, bipedal, unarmored herbivorous dinosaurs. These basal ornithopods and thesalosaurs are, like I said, a very neglected group within paleontology. And that's for the most reason why I'm studying them, to understand their evolution and in turn understand how early ornithopods evolved uh, 
their and also their evolutionary history and how they are also related to other dinosaur groups within Ornithischia, such as the group that can pertains Triceratops, as well as Pachycephalosaurus and Stegosaurus and uh, and Calosaurus. Because not much is not much is really known about their early evolution. There's a lot of papers out there that argue and argue about their relationship with one another, but there's really no consensus with it and there's just just needs to be a lot of work done and, and there's a few problems with some of those with those uh, papers when they do their uh, phylogenetic analysis but understanding this group and understanding the Triassic record of Ornithischia um, will help out a lot to understanding these uh, these questions and answering these questions about their early beginning um, but I really do try to set out to answer some of these really important questions while up here in uh, Alberta uh, studying uh, ornithis early Ornithischians and Thessalosaurs in general. So, but right now my current research, I've been looking at this Thessalosaur, new Thessalosaur material from this rock record, from this rock layer called the Wapiti Formation, which is approximately about 70 million years ago. And this is a gap in time in our knowledge of Thessalosaur evolution, as well as basal ornithopods, so, which is out, out of just exciting in general. So in this, so this project is very, very young. I'm still in the early stages of working on it. But any information that comes out of this fossil material is going to be very important for any type of basal and Thessalosaur, basal ornithopod and Thessalosaur evolution. But overall, it's pretty cool just looking at these fossil and describing them very very carefully well i often ask my guests about the subject of evolution in general and why it's important to understand its mechanisms and to combat science denial in general i know you're very keen on public outreach on the subject so if you were to say anything right now on the subject of evolution and why it's important what would you say um, so there are a lot of reasons of why it's important for people to really grasp and understand evolution. Um, it has a lot of practical importance, especially in the medical and, and of course, the agricultural field, um, such as the fact that like disease causing organisms are always evolving and are always resistant to our new treatments. But by studying evolution and how drug resistance evolves, uh, we can then come up with new techniques and new ways to try to treat these ever-evolving diseases. And the same thing with agriculture, such as uh, insects and diseases as well, evolve as, new, as we introduce new technologies. And they always change and always advance to beat these technologies, basically. And the same rules apply with the agri uh, in the agriculture as well as the medical field by studying these how evolution works, we can better understand and better have new technologies to combat these ever persistent bugs and diseases. But uh, also understanding evolution uh, connects us to, uh, gives us, I guess, a closer connection with all of life on the planet because in reality, every living thing on the planet is related to one another. And so you get this sense of connection that's, I guess, deeper uh, gives a much more meaning to life, I guess, that we're related to everything. In addition, I think evolution is just inherently just interests us as, as humans because it answers really deep philosophical questions like where we came from and what's our place in the universe. And I feel like a lot of this resistance to understand evolution in general is that somehow evolution makes life yeah, purposeless. I, I get that a lot, yeah. Yeah, but I, I really do not agree with it at all uh, because, yeah, evolution gives us a sense of connectedness with every living thing on the planet, like I said. And uh, let me just read a quote from Gary Verme, which is a evolutionary mm -hmm. biologist. Uh, the meaning and purpose is an emergent property of evolution. It is our own responsibility to make life le meaningful. But uh, evolution is very important. And it gives life plenty of meaning to me and uh, my work I do. Uh, and just gives us this overall connectedness with the everything in the natural world. And I think that's really important and really amazing at the same time that we have great this really understanding. Yeah. Gary Verme is, uh, is an amazing scientist. He's, he studies uh, just the mechanisms of evolution and in fossil bivalves and just 
bivalves in, gel in general. It was basically your clams and your oysters. But he's also blind. He's a blind mm. paleontologist, and he's described in uh, a whole lot of uh, different taxa of bivalves just by just by touching them, just by feeling their texture wow. and feeling their anatomy, which is just amazing in general. He's an, actually a very amazing uh, scientist. Okay, that is really great, Michael. Really fascinating stuff, and I know there's a lot more we could cover, no doubt. We'll speak again in the future, in a future mm -hmm. interview. Um, yep. We could even get into the nitty gritty of paleontology right down to things like radiometric dating and how fossils are dated. Are you, uh, are you up for that? Yes. Oh, yes. I would be more than happy to discuss anything about paleontology and anything geologically because uh, radiometric dating is just overall interesting in general. Fantastic. Well, I'll leave contact details and social media details in the description below. And all that's left to say now is thank you once again, and we will speak again very soon. Yep. Thank you for having me on uh, Evolution Soup. Uh, I really appreciate it, and I love just talking about paleontology and evolution in general. Thank you very much, Michael.